Good afternoon, everyone. How are you guys this lovely and actually quite beautiful Tuesday afternoon here in Southern California? Hopefully everything is well. And for those of you on YouTube, thank you so much for joining me in this archiving moment for this wonderful Tech Tuesday show. Sure. Teggy says, my vibe is so great. Keep it positive. Amen. And it's all about positivity. I can only focus on things I have control of. Built this K3V. Why did I build it? Why does it exist? Well, in a nutshell, the OEMs are partners that we've been working with for quite a few years. We have partners with partnerships with the OEM side from American Honda, with Hyundai, with Ford, with TRD. And all of these manufacturers are now focusing some of their efforts or quite a bit of investment into EV builds. And I was really against it. I, you guys, a lot of you know me. I am a diehard petrol guy. And just like the muscle code that said, any plans for another retro build, yeah. I love older cars. I love infusing newer technology, almost like a kind of retro mod or restore mod kind of, kind of build where I put modern injection and flex fuel and turbocharging with, and, and CAN bus and drive by wire into these older cars. So I love that, being able to capture the beauty of old cars and also incorporate newer technology. I love anti-lag. You guys have seen my videos where I'm shooting flames and doing this crazy stuff. I never had interest in the EV space. As a matter of fact, with the CRZ, <clears throat> which is right behind me here, or in front of me here, that was the first car that I ever played with that had, um, <coughs> I should have eaten that stuff before. It's the first car I played with that had um, any kind of electric motors in it. So it has this axial motor that exists between the gearbox and also the engine. And that allows you to use that as a generator and also an absorption unit. So that being said, hi to you as well, Alibu. Hello, Chine Mendewo. Um, it allows you the opportunity to have the benefits of petrol engine and without the range anxiety and also all the benefits of EV. And my first thing when we we're going to build this car is to take that out, dispose of it and put a K-series. And Honda said, absolutely not. So <laughs> I'm glad I stuck with it. We got it at 533 horsepower, 533 gearbox destroying horsepower. And it was amazing. And I was so amazed at the benefits of the electric motor. It allowed me to have great takeoff. It allowed me to have a seamless integration into boost. It allowed me to, without that lag, have a big turbo on the CRZ, where the EV part, the electric motor part, allowed me to have good power down low. And right when that power started tapering off, boom, the turbo kicked in. So it was amazing. I destroyed a BMW M3 right over here with this thing. And it was, guy was like, what is in that car? I'm like, hey, it's technology. So that was a little taste. And then Acura kept sending all those NSXs here. And then we took it to the drag strip, both Hedy and I. And we were, we were beating slick down V8 cars with 530 or so, 100, 560 or so horsepower in an NSX. And it's not because the thing was so powerful, the electric motors gave us the advantage. So I said, you know what? <sighs> Reluctantly, let me try. Um, spoke to quite a few people. There's a guy by the name of Ian. He's a voice actor in Hollywood. I had the opportunity to go to PEC and see his EV conversion. Spoke to Michael at, at Depth at EV West. He gave me some influence as well. Um, then my good friend, one of my fabricators here, uh, Marvin, showed me this video of this sand rail that's just killing people with EV. I said, that's it. This looks like it could be a really good performance platform. So that came to creation. I said, let me just build it, see how it is. It could be a great opportunity. It could be crappy. But I also want to build a car that if we build it, everyone pays attention. And hence, what was ideal? The 935. It's a platform that purists love because it's, it's almost in the heyday of Porsche Group 5 racing. Um, a lot of young guys may like the look because it's very wide and crazy aero. So the new Porsche files will say, hey, that's pretty cool. I kind of like that slant nose. And it's just something classic, something I just grew up loving. So why not use that? And that's what we did. We built that, and that was it. And First time I drove this thing, I was hooked. Guys, I can't explain. All the people out there who say that EVs don't have soul, they have never ever driven a performance EV. It is amazing. Absolutely fantastic. Um, Williams is asking, how useful would aerospace engineering be when building and designing cars and what aspects of improving a car's performance it can be utilized? Quite a few. The one thing about aerospace engineering, above and beyond aerodynamics being a key element in that design, is efficiency. Being able to, especially in aerospace, 
design components that not only become a lot more efficient, but you're constantly finding ways to improve their efficiency, constantly finding ways of improving travel, fuel, heat management. These are all things that are important in designing and building cars, especially in the performance arena. So studying aerospace engineering and taking a few electives in the mechanical engineering, like heat and mass transfer, fluid dynamics, thermal, taking those electives, which are also transferred to your aerospace curriculum very nicely, can help you become a better automotive design engineer. So it does work together very well. Which vehicle are you most scared of to drive? The turbo Porsche or the electric Porsche? It says 1959 EL, by far this EV. For many years, um, the Porsche, blue Porsche, which is I'm looking at here, the IROC Porsche, I'll try and flip this around so you guys can see it. Um, forgive me on YouTube once again. So you see that blue IROC Porsche right there? That vehicle is a car that many people were afraid of. Journalists like, this thing should be on the street. I remember Matt Farrar, like, my goodness, this thing is just ridiculous. He was like driving around at 60% throttle. The guys from um, DDE just drove it a couple months ago and they are like, oh, this is ridiculous. Hello, Turbo Smart headquarters. <laughs> Good seeing you indeed. Turbo Smart are my neighbors here with, and they're immaculate experts in turbocharging control systems. So thank you so much for being who you are. But for me, this 850 horsepower, 2400 pound vehicle was just comfortable. I love it, it was very good. Back here, that thing is terrifying. I did my little BC mode in the corner here, I almost crashed. It is, even though it doesn't have as much horsepower peak, the torque is significantly more than the blue Porsche. And that torque happens very much lower, so it is much scarier to drive. Christy Dacosta is asking, do you think there's potential for hydrogen cars to have serious performance like EVs now have? It's possible, it's just that the density of hydrogen is quite challenging. What I, what I end up seeing, um, probably short term, to make that goal a reality, which I think is fantastic, is using hydrogen as a means to generate electricity for the EVs. So I see that, and it's so weird. You have companies like BMW and American Honda who are investing, and Hyundai, who are investing a little bit more into hydrogen-based vehicles, but they seem to be going more full-fledged into plug-in hybrids and plug-in EVs. What's your thought process when doing unorthodox builds like the Porsche EV Porsche? It's really to create awareness. I mean, think about it. If I built the EV Porsche with a standard G body, or a long hood, 67, 912, or some, a lot of people really wouldn't pay attention to it. Um, our goal is to create awareness that the performance EV segment is real and can be quite enjoyable. And what better way of doing that to using a platform that's very eye-catching, very beautiful, and very well executed. So the team and I did a great job with this, and we have even something more exciting to come. So for those purists that are very upset with me and vexed that I did this, because I, I get it all, people, people ask me if it's, um, <laughs> people ask me or tell me that I, I, I murdered a car, I, I, forgive me, I've been working like a bit dead here, I've taken the engine apart before we did this, um, that I, I, I desecrated a 935, is sacrilege. Guys, honestly, I saved this car and I have another one I'm saving now and that's gonna be crazier than this one. So that's gonna be absolutely fantastic. Does the EV have its factory transaction? Not at all. Mr. MR2 Freak, if I put a factory like this year chassis, which is 84, had a 915 gearbox. If I put that 915 gearbox with this kind of power and torque, it would last a few seconds. It would destroy that gearbox. There's just not, there's no way. So it has its own dedicated transaxle. It's quite robust. The only drivetrain part that has factory, as you saw with a few of my posts a moment ago, the factory axle stub snapped. So that's the one thing that's still of the factory drivetrain that exists and it's snapped clean off on both sides. So thank goodness I opted with drive shaft shops axles and those guys, their axles are amazing and held. But the one factory part that I had in drivetrain on this EV went goodbye. So working with drive shaft shop to make something even more robust and we should be good to go after that. Which car in your stable will post the best time at the ring? Be us apart, honestly. That, that EV. Prior to this, it would have been the blue 911, but now it's, it's this. Or it, it would have been a tie maybe between the blue 911 and maybe the wagon, um, but definitely this, this performance EV, the 935 is definitely the one that can do that.
Do you think it's possible to build a battery pack with a BMS that allows switching between parallel and series for high amperage or voltage with a quick launch and a high top speed? Yes. However, Carter Backer Customs, there is an inherent danger in what you just mentioned. And I'll just tell you what it is. It is extremely dangerous to connect parallel packs if their voltage is only in close delta to each other. Very, very, very dangerous. So what I prefer to do is to have parallel packs exist and only have them connect when they're within three volts of each other. And even that three volts is very generous on my part. I should tighten that up quite a bit. So I would rather have the parallel packs in continuity, unless there's an issue and you can dis deactivate them um, as, as, as the issue comes about. But I'd rather use torque management to limit and use the BMS as a means to monitor and let things happen via the BMS to make sure things are okay. But I wouldn't condone having, a, let's say, a, a, one pack running and then adding a parallel on demand because that could be quite detrimental if not done properly. Are easy, EV swaps easy enough for the average home garage guy? I would say no. I really mean it. To do an EV swap is not like, and, and I appreciate that the time will come when packages can be very safe, but you need to have a very, very good understanding of electrical engineering to do it properly. Um, it's very dangerous. I'm dealing with over 400 volts in this. Um, there are systems out there that deal in 800 volts plus, so it's quite dangerous. You have to have a lot of safety equipment. You have to be very careful. Even with IMA setups, Right, when I mean IMA integrated motor assist, like what you would see in the CRZ over here, without the right tools, you shouldn't play with it either. Those can actually, with the magnets that exist with the center flywheel assembly, um, with all the windings inside of it, it could sever your fingers if you use your hands to pull it. it can, you can try to pull it like it suck you and sever all your digits. So you need proper tools and proper understanding of it. So the answer is no, it's just too dangerous. And there's so many things you can do improperly that can get you in trouble. So what I foresee, from a do-it-yourself perspective in the EV world is where companies like ours, or companies like EV, they will put together these kits and then you can install them. But the kits are pretty much complete. To start from scratch and start, you know, wiring up stuff, I mean, simple things like bus bars and connections and it can, it's, guys, it's so dangerous. I mean, I was alien to it myself, but I had to really go back and brush up on my electrical engineering background I had to talk to a lot of engineers. Um, I had to consult with people from, from wow, KNU and, and Karma and um, Faraday Future, even Matt Peterson, um, uh, Michael Bream, uh, Andrew Drawd. I had to consult with these other well-established electrical engineers to even assist me with this. So. But my engineering background came into play significantly. And then, so if you go into my office, I have drawings all over the place, all into my wife's office, drawings everywhere with just circuitry and, 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 and flow charts. It's all over the place. If you come to office, any of you who've been to office doing this, you know, no touch that you see everywhere, I've drawn, drawn things everywhere. So it's quite, it's quite interesting. Bad Chasing says, how do you get to where you are right now? I'm going towards the same area as you. Need a good feeling of where to start. Um, persistence, dedication, and a lot of hard work. It's not easy. Guys, I left a well-paying six-figure job in pharmaceuticals in 2006 to open up Bisimoto. And for two years, I did not make much of anything. I, I mean it. I spent a lot of time creating the brand and working hard and in an industry that was challenged because of the economic downturn and also in an environment where competitors found more pleasure in trying to focus on bringing someone else down than their own products. So it was really a very interesting time. But by staying persistent and focused, it allowed me to get to where I am today, which by the way, I'm nowhere near where I want to be. So I'm still very focused on increasing and going forward. I find the new stations that exist or the new future mobility very exciting. And it's my goal to be part of that, especially in the high performance EV space. It's something I find extremely fascinating, you know? 
Are EVs easier to learn to tune than a normal car? That is to be determined. Um, we're still in the embassy, but as we sit now, I would say no, because there's so many parameters that are not very commonplace, that are not very well known, that have to go into tuning EV platforms. So that being said, and thank you so much for joining me as well, Imran from India. Um, I do have to go, my time is already up. So thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Beast More Tech Tuesday. I'll have it here on Instagram for another 24 hours. I will then chop it up with my good friend Mickey, who's uh, Mickey's up front, and then make it condensed for you so it can be like a seven to 10 minute condensed version, all the good stuff in it, and we'll put that on YouTube. So if you haven't subscribed to the BC Moto YouTube page, go over right now, BC Moto on YouTube, subscribe, and you'll be able to see this and more. And what I'm doing with this Cayman, you'll be able to see that too, because I'm doing some really crazy stuff. All right, guys, thank you for joining me this afternoon. Have a pleasant day, stay safe, and cheers. Bye-bye.